The history of firearms design is really littered with the, the wreckage of good projects, well-intentioned, that simply didn't go anywhere successfully. And today we're taking a look at one of them. Thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, where we are taking a look at a pair of Whitney Wolverine pistols. Now these are distinctive in large part because of their looks, and they are just the epitome of the 1950s space age aesthetic. Uh, swoopy lines, all aluminum manufacture, really very cool guns. Uh, the design uh, was the product of one Robert Hilberg, or Bob Hilberg. Um, Hilberg was a was a pretty distinguished firearms designer uh, in his time. He was in the military and then went to work uh, at a succession of companies. He worked for Colt initially. He had actually approached Colt looking to sell a submachine gun design. Colt looked at it and decided, you know, we don't really want to build this, but you look like a talented guy and we'd like to hire you. And that kind of took him completely by surprise, and he ended up accepting the offer and worked at Colt for several years. Uh, during World War II he then moved into the aircraft industry, he worked for Pratt & Whitney. After the war he went to work for Republic uh, Aviation. And then he got hired by the High Standard Company. So even, even when he was working in the aircraft industry he was still interested in firearms. He did some design work on uh, 20mm cannon feeding systems for aerial guns. He is, is an underappreciated name, but really quite a talented designer. Now, at High Standard, he did all the development on the T-152, which was the product improved version of the Browning 1919 intended for use in tanks. I actually have a separate video on that gun if you're interested in it. Um, when High Standard did that project, they were hired to make a small number of prototypes for the military, to basically do the development work, not necessarily to actually manufacture the guns in huge quantity. So, Rather than try and set up a specific production line to do those, they actually subcontracted most of the machining work to a company called Belmore Johnson Tool. Hilberg was working closely with Belmore Johnson because they were manufacturing the gun that he was designing, and after that project finished he actually ended up being hired by Belmore Johnson. They'd been hoping to get a, actually get a large contract to make the guns for the government, and they thought that having Hilberg on staff would help out with that. Now, we're going to leave the, the machine guns aside, because Bob Hilberg had been tinkering with an idea for a handgun for some time. He had initially called this the Trimatic, and it was a little tip-up barrel pistol that could be uh, interchanged between 22, 32, and 380 caliber. Um, he had noted that all three of these cartridges are almost exactly the same in length, and thus, and this isn't the only firearm that was ever conceived that has that sort of caliber interchangeability. At any rate, the, the Trimatic kind of morphed into what was first called the Lightning, and then the Wolverine, and then just the Whitney pistol, um, and came into this form. Now, as it was originally drawn up by Hilberg, the, the Trimatic looks kind of like this. It also kind of looks like a Vector CP1. It's definitely got those kind of futuristic, retro-futuristic now maybe, swoopy lines to it, and um, very cool looking. So uh, to get back to the meat of our story here, uh, Hilberg starts discussing this pistol idea with his new, uh, his, his new associates at Belmore Johnson Tool. And they decide that they kind of want to get into the firearms manufacturing business, and they think it would be a good idea to design and build this pistol of Hilberg's. So in 1955 they set up a subsidiary company to do firearms manufacturing on a commercial scale. It's called Hilson. Uh, which is a combination of Hilberg and Johnson. It was primarily, there were like six major officers of Belmore Johnson who were stockholders in it, but the two guys really running the show were Johnson and um, Bob Hilberg. And in 1956 they actually start production on their pistol. Now the deal with this, remember this is pre-internet age, and they decide they want to find a company to do all of their marketing and distribution for them. And they find that in a company called J. L. Galef and Son, and they they write up a contract which would prove really prove to be a big part of the undoing of this pistol. And the contract stipulates that Galef will have exclusive worldwide distribution rights to the pistol, and they will take care of all the marketing. They have to order ten thousand guns in the first year, and they have an option for I think it was three additional years after that. They could maintain their exclusive distributorship if they ordered 10,000 pistols each year. 
Uh, in exchange, uh, the Hilson Company, which by the way would end up fairly quickly being renamed uh, the Whitney, Firearm, Whitney Firearms Incorporated, uh, just to kind of grab the, the historical branding of the Whitney name, based on Eli Whitney, huge, huge element in uh, both firearms manufacture and the American Industrial Revolution. At any rate, um, they, they sell these pistols to Galef for $16.53 a piece, which is pretty cheap. Um, they had gone through and done a bunch of costing estimates and planning, and figured this would be a, a, a price that was low enough to attract a company like Galef to do their distribution, but high enough that they could be a, make a sustainable nice little profit on it. So they go into this, uh, production starts in 1956, and it slowly ramps up until in July and August it, it hits its peak of about 330 guns per week, which is that's pretty decent production. The problem is they're not making enough money on this pistol. Uh, they underestimated the actual cost. Shocking how that might happen, not that that happens all the time uh, in startup manufacturing and especially in the firearms industry. But unfortunately they figured that they were like three dollars short of where they needed to be to actually make the, the manufacturing economically sustainable. So they had a plan, they were going to see if they could make a few changes, and they figured as they increased their volume their cost would decrease and they'd be able to, you know, to do better. Well the problem is right about this time, as they're delivering more and more pistols in this 10,000 unit order to Galef, Galef comes back to them and says, you know what? we're actually having some trouble selling these, so go ahead and like slow down your deliveries. We don't need all that many right now. And that was a huge problem for Whitney, because of course they've got nowhere else to go. They have made, they've obligated themselves to only sell the guns to Galef. Uh, they can't change the price, they can't sell to anybody else, and now they've just been told the one thing that might have saved it, like being able to manufacture more of them and get a better volume price on a lot of the work they were doing, well, now you can't do that either. This put them into a serious financial crimp. Uh, and ultimately it would lead to the company's bankruptcy. The last of the 10,000 pistols were delivered in May of 1957, and that same year uh, Hilson and, well, Hilson, Hilberg and Johnson looked at this situation and realized they, they have no way out of this. And so they, they started looking for someone, they could either default on the whole thing, on all of the debt that they had taken on to get the company started, or they could sell the whole company. And they ended up finding a buyer in the name of a guy named Charles Lowe, uh, who bought the entire company, all of its assets, all of its patent rights, for $100,000. And that conveniently repaid the $100,000 initial debt that they had taken on to start the company but it left them with something like $80,000 in additional accumulated debt that they had spent actually you know, manufacturing those first 10,000 pistols. And it's really pretty impressive, uh, especially today, to consider that in light of this uh, they could have probably figured out some way to walk away from, from that debt. But instead uh, Hilberg and the officers of Belmore Johnson Tool, who were financially involved in the company, they actually they went back to work at Belmore Johnson doing what they had been doing, and over the course of several years they managed, despite some significant financial hardship, to pay back all of the debts that they had accumulated on the Whitney Wolverine pistol design. Um, Hilberg was also particularly concerned about the employees that he had brought on. He had really legitimately thought that this was uh, a fantastic opportunity. Uh, that it would lead to a, a much bigger company, they would have a, a wider product line, and it'd be a great opportunity. And he had brought in people that he knew and genuinely cared about, and it really hurt him to see those people basically end up fired after a year when the company went under. And so he uh, he put in not a trivial amount of effort trying to find new jobs for all of his employees, and actually did pretty well at it. And a lot of the employees of the Whitney Company would go on to have uh, relatively distinguished careers of their own elsewhere in the industry. So that's a really cool side note on what is otherwise kind of a depressing project. To get back to our story, Lowe and his lawyers figured that technically speaking he had not purchased Whitney Firearms Incorporated. He had actually purchased that company's physical assets, their pistols, their tooling, their building, and he had purchased their intellectual assets, their patent rights, and then he created a new firm, the Whitney Firearms Company, which started making the same gun, but he figured because of this, because he didn't technically buy the old company, 
uh, he was not bound by this exclusive distributorship contract with Galef. And so he was going to start selling pistols directly himself, and that was, that was his plan to make this whole endeavor profitable. The problem was, as soon as he started doing that, in February of 1958, the Galef company sued him, saying that, basically, no, you are bound by this distributorship contract, and you can't sell pistols, only we can sell pistols. This lawsuit would drag on for four years. It wouldn't ultimately be resolved until January of 1962, and at that point it was done by private agreement. It never actually did go to a, a final court ruling. And this really put a crimp on Lowe's ability and inclination to sell guns. Because if he kept selling a lot of pistols, and then ultimately lost the lawsuit, all of his profit, he would have to turn over to Galef. So for a while he kept building pistols and just kind of putting them in storage, um, and ultimately he wouldn't make all that many. In total, uh, Lowe only manufactured 2,578 Whitney pistols. Add that to the 10,000 and change uh, that had been manufactured by the original company, and you have a grand total of 13,371 of these manufactured in total. Uh, and Lowe, after those 2,568, uh, Lowe shut down operations, it wasn't profitable, and the guns were bought out wholesale by a couple of big distributors who you know, bought five to seven hundred and fifty each, and then the guns would spend the next couple of years trickling out onto the commercial market, generally at a lower price than what they'd initially been set at by Galef. So um, that kind of, in a nutshell, is the story of the Whitney pistol. So. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at these, and some of the mechanical details and how they work, and then we'll come back and talk about why this pistol failed in the way it did. Yeah, this is totally a Buck Rogers pistol right here. Uh, so what we have is 22 caliber, semi-automatic, has a heel magazine release, has a 10-round magazine. There's some cool mechanical features to this that we'll take a look at in just a moment. It does have a magazine safety, so it can only be fired with the magazine inserted. Hammer fired, got our hammer right there. And then this is not actually a slide, it is a tubular shroud with the, the working bits on the inside. So pretty cool there. Uh, the whole lower assembly is a single aluminum casting, as is the back strap and these two little cocking piece ears. And uh, this was kind of one of the, the more futuristic elements of the gun, aside from its looks, were its use of aluminum. That was a rare thing at this time. Now the standard guns, like this one, had this... it, it looks like it's blued, but of course it's aluminum, so it's an anodized uh, finish with these uh, brown plastic grips. However, the gun has become a bit more distinctive for the nickel-plated version. Now the nickel version of this gun really took those Buck Rogers looks and cranked them up an extra notch. It looks even cooler uh, in nickel. Now most of the nickel ones will actually have kind of creamy white or ivory white grip panels. This one is a bit of an exception. Um, this is here at an auction, and the consigner states that this pistol was given to him directly by Bob Hilberg. So, uh, and it's not quite in the right serial range for a commercial nickel-plated pistol, so this is probably one that Hilberg himself had nickeled as an experiment, and they used the standard grips on it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Since we're talking about the nickeled finished guns, uh, let me mention that only 500 of the 13,000 of these made, only 500 were actually nickeled, and they will fall into the serial number range of 32,546 through 33,099. So this one comes a couple hundred before, uh, because it does have the special circumstance of, of coming directly from Hilberg. That is understandable. Uh, there, one should be aware that there are absolutely fake nickel Wolverines out there, because they do bring a, a significant premium. So if you are presented with a nickel-plated, or a nickel-finish Whitney Wolverine, and the serial number is outside of that 32546 to 33099 range, you should be very suspicious of it. Now when we look at markings, on the left side you'll see Whitney. They originally, the first couple thousand guns, also said Wolverine, because that was the name that they had chosen for the pistol. Allegedly, I can't prove this, but it seems as reasonable as anything else, allegedly because Bob Hilberg was a really big fan of the Michigan Wolverines, and the name sounded cool to Galef. So 
But like, why not? What more reason do you need to pick that as the name? The problem was they didn't look into it all that deeply, and it turned out that Wolverine was actually a trademark name of the Lyman Company for a line of scopes that they had. Well, the uh, the board of uh, the corporate officers of Belmore Johnson Tool were good friends with some of the corporate officers of Lyman, and they came to a a very a, you know amenable gentleman's agreement to avoid any sort of lawsuit that Whitney would simply stop using the name Wolverine. Um, and Lyman would let the whole matter drop. So the first couple thousand guns say Wolverine, the rest of them they left that off. Now this will apply slightly differently to the boxes, which we'll get to in a moment. On the other side we have Whitney Firearms Incorporated, uh, New Haven, Connecticut. This would change later to the Whitney Firearms Company after it was purchased by Lowe. Uh, and the serial numbers are an interesting thing. So. They made a total of 13,371 of these. This is serial, serial number 29,000, which raises an obvious and immediate question. Well, they actually, the first gun that they produced commercially was serial number 100,001, because they were anticipating fairly high sales and they wanted to make them look even higher. The problem was, after they got a couple thousand in, they realized that like they weren't selling that fast, and this 100,000 serial number looked kind of goofy. And so they made a change, and uh, they, they dropped the serial number back to 23,000. So the first couple thousand are in the, the 100s, 100 thousands, uh, and then they dropped to 23,000 and pretty much run straight on from there to about 37,000. Um, you'll notice that is also too many numbers. Well, there were actually some gaps in the serial number range. But basically, uh, what you will run into is about 100 to maybe 103,000, and then uh, 23 through uh, 37. So 29,000 here is kind of mid to mid late production. Well, mid production. When they made this jump to serial number 23,000, they did it in conjunction with another change, and that was changing the actual alloy specification of the aluminum that they were using. The problem was they had started with um, a, a number 218 alloy, and it was a really good alloy, it was very strong, but it was also a little expensive. And one of the things they decided to try and do, uh, well, they were looking for ways to cut costs, because this is during that period when Galef has told them to stop shipping so many guns, how do we, how do we try and make this a profitable arrangement? And it just happens that as part of the molding process, or the, the, the casting process for these uh, raw frames, they would periodically pour plastic into the mold uh, just to check on its condition. You know, we'll, we'll make a plastic example to see if anything's getting particularly worn. And they had one of these plastic, you know, check, you know, quality control uh, uh, frames sitting around at the shop. And someone got the thought of, well, for kicks, let's go ahead and assemble a gun. Like, let's finish this plastic frame and assemble a gun on it. And they discovered that it actually worked. And so then they put a couple thousand rounds through it and discovered it still actually worked. There, the, the stresses were all taken up in, in the top half of the gun, the steel slide and everything, or the steel shroud. And they weren't willing to go so far as to actually make a plastic frame. That probably would have been a commercially bad idea. But what it did make them realize is that they could get away with a much weaker aluminum alloy. So they changed alloys to three, uh, alloy, a, a number 380 alloy. And the finish wasn't quite as nice, but they figured that was an acceptable trade-off because they were able to reduce their cost by not a trivial amount. Um, and it is at that change that they also changed the serial number blocks. One of the really cool design aspects of this pistol is the rear sight, not normally something you'd get excited about. Um, it's just this very simple piece of flat sheet steel bent in a half circle and slid into the top of the shroud there, the barrel shroud. Now Hilberg had been trying to figure out what sort of rear sight he could put on this gun. Um, he wasn't a huge fan, he needed something that was adjustable, so he couldn't just uh, cast it into the, the top of the assembly here. Uh, he wasn't really excited by the idea of dovetailing something in, because it would almost certainly be a steel sight dovetailed into this aluminum piece of uh, forging. And so that would wear quickly and, and have potential problems. And he actually mentioned this problem to a friend of his by the name of Harry Seafried, um, who is also a firearms designer. And Harry thought about it, and apparently in the space of about an afternoon, came up with this idea, scribbled it down on some paper, and, and suggested it to Hilberg. And it looked 
Brilliant. Uh, the cutout there that you see actually creates a, a shadow that gives you a nice, crisp sight picture. Like you can see there. Let's see if we can get the front sight in focus. So there's the front sight, uh, and then it'll come back to the rear sight here in a moment. Um, that is a really simple way to get a really nice, crisp sight picture. And Hilberg asked Seyfried if he could use this, and Seyfried basically said, uh, sure, why not? They never bothered to patent it. Uh, Colt would end up actually using something like this in the 1970s on a different gun. Um, but just a really innovative, simple, easy solution. This is adjustable for windage, you can tap it back and forth, uh, but because it's not really a dovetail, it's just tension on these two little grooves, it doesn't cause any undue wear, and it doesn't become loose over time. To disassemble the Whitney, we're going to start at the muzzle. We have uh, a threaded muzzle nut here. You push down the little plunger and unscrew this. There we go. You do have to make sure that the hammer is cocked, and you have to take the magazine out. Then you can actually pull the whole internal frame, or internal bolt assembly, out of the gun. A little stiff. Uh, it's a little stiff at times because it's actually pushing down on the hammer here. So once you've got this out, this is all aluminum. You can set this aside. So this is really the mechanical heart of the pistol. Uh, this is actually steel, unlike the rest of that uh, frame, which is aluminum. And the way it works is that this nut at the front holds the barrel in place, and then this, the rest of this steel assembly slides back and forth when you fire. So we've got a breech block here, barrel up in front, and that's all retained within this steel tube. Yeah. Now up at the very front of the assembly we have a washer and a little key. Uh, in this case those stuck in the frame and kind of fell out separately when I disassembled it. That happens from time to time. Uh, but when you reassemble it you need to put them back in like this. And this simply uh, locks the barrel in the proper orientation in the frame. So once it's out you can take those two pieces out. The next thing is a, another key here that locks the firing pin in place, prevents it from coming out. Uh, this is held in place by the top of the aluminum frame. So when the gun's out of the frame we can tap that out. Don't lose that. Remember, this isn't a military pistol. You don't have to worry about you know, disassembling this while being subjected to mortar fire or anything. Once the keyway is out, then the firing pin can come out. It's a rimfire pistol, so that's your firing pin. Once the firing pin is out, we can then unscrew this rear uh, set of cocking ears. This is another aluminum piece, and this is something that you need to be careful with, because probably the most common way to break these pistols is to squeeze on these two, and these wings can actually snap off. And if you break something like this, good luck finding a replacement today. So be gentle with these. When you're, use, when you're cycling this, don't squeeze together, just pull backwards. Next up we have a cross pin here, uh, which holds the breech block in place. The manual actually suggests that uh, the firing pin makes a good tool for pushing that out. And you kind of also want to hold a little bit of tension on the barrel so that it's not pushing on the breech block. You can pop that guy out, and then the breech block will come out the back of the gun. This one's nice and tight. There we go. And we can then bring the barrel out the back as well. I'm going to use a plastic punch here just to push on the barrel. There we go. So there's our barrel, recoil spring, and the empty slide. We can take out the last couple little pieces here as well. Uh, the ejector just slips out. It's got that little bend in it that slips right in there. And we can pretty much do the same thing with the extractor, which is going to pop out like that. It's got a little spring-loaded plunger there that holds it in place, so you can push it in like so, and take it out. There you go. There are all of the working pieces of a Whitney Wolverine. It 
seems like a lot of pieces, and for a military pistol this would be an unacceptable sort of disassembly. But once you've taken apart something like a Ruger standard model, uh, this isn't so bad. One of the elements that Hilberg put a lot of development into was actually the recoil spring. The recoil spring that he designed for this isn't quite round wire, and it's not quite flat wire either. Uh, he didn't want the corners on flat wire, but he also wanted the spring to be able to compress uh, nice and evenly like a flat wire spring. So this is actually round wire where the top and bottom surfaces have been ground flat. It was a fairly expensive thing to do, um, especially in context of the rest of the pistol, but it makes for a really nice mainspring for these guns. I also want to point out a couple interesting elements of the magazine design. Uh, for one thing, the magazine is tapered, narrow at the top and wide at the bottom, to make it a little bit, uh, a little bit easier to insert. So there's a nice big hole at the bottom of the pistol that's easy to get the magazine into, and then it just kind of expands and locks itself in uh, as you insert it. And then the magazine is also slightly tapered uh, to be narrow at the front and wider at the back. And the idea here is that your cartridges would actually alternate, pushing to the left and pushing to the right. And what that meant is that the rims would be offset from each other. So here, and then there, and then here, and then there, and so on. Which meant that you didn't need the curve that is often seen in 22 caliber magazines, uh, because the body of the cartridge is actually straight. The curve only comes when the rim of one round sits on top of the body or the rim of the round below it. So by staggering them left and right, he was able to keep the stack of cartridges relatively flat. That is a really cool magazine design. Um, he also put a little hole in here. That's the right size so that you can stick a, an empty 22 casing in to use as a handle to help pull the follower down if you need to. And then the magazine is, is uh, marked where you have 10 rounds and 5 rounds capacity. Just a quick look at the Whitney boxes here. I mentioned that early on they picked the name Wolverine, but then dropped it. It was only like the first 2,000 guns that had the name Wolverine on them. However, they had ordered a whole bunch of boxes. So Wolverine remained on the boxes for a much longer time, because they went ahead and just used what they had ordered before making a new one. So this is the first version of the box. Inside you have actually a pretty nice set of uh, parts list, exploded diagram, disassembly and operating instructions, little note about reassembly, and then they actually used corrugated cardboard cut in the shape of the Whitney pistol to sit the gun in the box. Later on this would be replaced by a slightly different form. Uh, they first replaced the cardboard with this molded plastic uh, in the shape of the pistol, and then they replaced the actual box design, once they ran out of the first ones, with one that just says Whitney, and no longer says Wolverine. It's generally agreed that the Whitney pistol is a pretty good pistol by itself. The problems with it that led to this being a commercial failure were largely problems of marketing. When Hilberg and Johnson, when they signed this distributorship with Galef, they had been anticipating that the guns would be sold primarily over the counter. That they would send out samples to gun shops um, and distributors, and people could go into a gun shop and look at a Whitney and pick it up and handle it and recognize how light it was and how great the handling was, and buy it there and take it home. This is the 1950s. That's how, you know, even to this day, that's how a lot of people buy guns rather than over the internet. What they found instead was that Galef was actually marketing these guns almost entirely mail order. Now, prior, this was prior to 1968, so that was easy to do. There were no licenses or anything involved. You could write away for a pistol, uh, send a couple dollars, pay for the rest of it cash on delivery, and they'd just ship you a gun to your house. The problem was, it's harder to market a gun that way, because all people had to go on was a little advertising blurb and a picture. They couldn't handle it. They couldn't feel the gun's actual physical characteristics. And on top of that, Galef didn't actually do all that much marketing. Um, the best thing they ever had happen was an article in Guns magazine, uh, which was quite positive. But they didn't run very many advertisements. They ran a few, a couple ads a year in some of the major magazines. But not the sort of advertising campaign that would have been required to get a brand new pistol like this noticed and actually appealing to people. Um, the price on the gun was not was maybe competitive, but not or was comparable, but not super competitive. So 
The Whitney Wolverine was sold for $39.95 in the standard blued configuration, and an extra $5, so $44.95, uh, nickeled. And you could compare that to, well, the Ruger standard model, uh, what the gun that's still on the market today in its, I believe, Mark IV iteration. Those were a little cheaper. Those were $37.50. So a couple dollars less, you could get a Ruger, which, by the way, was sold largely over the counter. So you could go into the shop, handle one, and go, ah, yes, this is a nice pistol, and walk home with it. Uh, you could get the, the Colt uh, Sportsman and Huntsman pistols were a little bit more expensive at $46 and change. But then you also had high standard pistols that were competitively priced. And this was in many ways a golden age of surplus firearms. There were a ton of surplus pistols out there that you could get for as little as, well, just under $10. So the Whitney had a lot of competition, and Galef didn't do enough to meet that competition. The Whitney pistol has become really fairly popular with collectors. It's this cool example of a very unique looking, very reminiscent of the 1950s atomic age uh, pistol, relatively inexpensive, manufactured in the U.S., designed by an American, um, actually really legitimately mechanically a good pistol, um, and of course out of production since 1962, and thus relatively unavailable, collectible, etc. Uh, it's unfortunate for Bob Hilberg that people didn't have that attitude when the guns were originally for sale, but such is life. Uh, what's interesting is there was actually an attempt to bring back the Whitney. In 2002, uh, the Olympic Firearms Company, probably best known for its AR-15s, talked to Hilberg, and they decided that they wanted... Well, all the patents were expired at that point, so there was nothing to stop them, but they, they actually talked to Hilberg about this project and got his blessing on it. They wanted to reintroduce the Whitney, and at Hilberg's suggestion, they actually replaced the aluminum lower with a polymer lower to make it a bit more modern uh, and a bit more cost-effective. Uh, those were introduced in 2002, and even those failed to do very well. Uh, by 2017, I believe, um, those had gone out of production. You can find them occasionally on the civilian... on the second-hand market now, but the reproduction Whitneys were also not that popular of a gun. I think there is an element of this that people wanted the historical version, and even if the new version had the same sort of handling, eh, it just wasn't the same. So. Uh, I think future collectors will find... Anyone who has a Whitney now, in 10 or 20 years, is going to wish that they also had one of the polymer Olympic ones, just because by that point it will have achieved some of the same, uh, you know, cult status as the originals, and it's a nice piece to add to a collection of someone who has an original uh, Whitney. But uh, at any rate, I think that pretty well covers the whole story of the the, the Trimatic turned Lightning turned Wolverine turned just Whitney. If you would like either of these two examples, they are both coming up for sale here at Rock Island uh, in their May of 2019 premier auction. So you can take a look at their catalog to get the details, price estimates, bid online, all that sort of stuff, and also check out everything else they have in that auction. Thanks for watching.